glad everybody's here today. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I don't know exactly what topic I will talk about because I like to talk a lot. Uh, that's part of my business. Um, but a little bit about myself, uh, first of all. Um, you heard some of my, my bio. Uh, I do a lot of uh, community activities um, just to kind of keep me away from going crazy with my business activities. Uh, what I do for my real job is I am the currently the vice president of sales for Industrial Supply Company. Industrial Supply Company is going to be 100 years next year. I haven't been there quite that long. I've been there about 33 years. So I look like I'm young, but I've got a lot of years underneath me. Um, I'm actually transitioning positions. Uh, so this is fun to kind of talk about that. I'm moving into the position of vice president of business development, new business development, uh, which is an exciting opportunity for me. Um, I'll be responsible for bringing in to the company approximately who, another $40 million over the next five years. So I either do this or I might, I might be out the door. So, <laughs> but that's fun, that's, that's part of the fun. Um, are you guys all business majors or technology folks? Business management? Oh, okay. Um, I, like, I like to be interactive. I like people to ask me questions, and, and I'm kind of learning because I'm usually pretty shy in front of a camera. I like to talk one-on-one -on -one and in small groups, but not to the masses. Um, industrial Supply Company, we're a full-line industrial distribution company, which means we supply everything from hammers to screwdrivers, um, small pieces of equipment, um, janitorial products, safety products. One of our biggest challenges, as you can tell by that product group, is that there are a multitude of competitors out there in the marketplace for the products that we supply. I mean, you yourself, think about how many places you can go buy a hammer just offhand. I mean, you got Lowe's, Home Depot, um, a couple of the other industrial distributors, Walmart, just about anybody. So one of our big challenges is to differentiate ourselves on a daily basis so that we can get customers, especially the large industrial users and manufacturers, to come to us to purchase their products. Um, and we've been very successful to that point where we're about a $90 million company right now. Um, so to sell screwdrivers and hammers and, and all that, to add up to $90 million takes a lot of effort. And it's done through teamwork. Um, the sales team, of course, we're the front line for the company. We're out there shaking the trees, making the leaves fall so the dollars creep into the company. But we also have all of our support teams, our inside folks taking orders. We've got our accounts payable people, um, accounts receivable folks, our technology people. Um, our operations is, is our, our blood's vein. That's our heart of our whole operation. Um, and it's, it's difficult to put all that together to create a viable product that you can differentiate yourself to these customers. Um, it's, it's fun, but it's challenging. Those of you that are going into business management will find that out um, <laughs> kind of the hard way. Really, you know, you, you, you do all this work and you go through school, and this gives you a great foundation for having some understanding about what you're going to run into and some of the challenges you're going to see. But one of the most intriguing things is the fact that you learn every single day still. When you, you get tired of taking tests and, and having classes and doing all that, that never ends in life. That never ends on your job. And as long as you keep that in mind and you continue to try to get better every single day, it'll be fun for you. You'll have a full understanding. And all of you are here because you've understood that you need to work hard and get to that point where you can have um, some success in life. Being able to learn every single day, I found, is one of the biggest keys to keep that energy going to keep yourselves alive. My education came kind of a little backwards in the beginning. I graduated from the University of Utah with my bachelor's. Then I came here to Salt Lake Community College because I got a job in sales management. And I was like, well, I don't know what I'm doing in sales management. You know, let me figure this out. I said, well, where am I going to get this information? Because I asked my boss, hey, uh, how, do I, how, am I, how do I become a sales manager? Go manage people. Go sell stuff. And I'm like, well, I know how to sell stuff, but I don't know how to manage people. So I came here and I got into the marketing department and uh, got my associates in marketing management, which was one of the best 
educations I could have ever had. I competed in DEX, is it Decanal instead of DEX? Decanal, it was DEX back there. That tells you how old I am. Um, and that gave me an opportunity to really get out and work with teams and help understand how to get those teams together to put together these, this presentation to go out there to the masses and compete. And we did very, very well here for Salt Lake Community College when we did that. Um, and then after I did that, I waited about 10 years in my education. I went back and got my master's, um, which was really difficult because I had young children at the time and, and my wife thought I was you know, leaving her for somebody else special. But I, I put that two and a half years in and got that completed. And I did that because I wanted to get a master's in management so that I can figure out how to better manage the people that I was responsible for so that I could help them become successful. And I think as a manager, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to make our company successful, but first of all, we have to make our people successful. If our people aren't successful, our company won't be successful. That's very simple. So it's a constant engagement with your, your folks that work for you, your customers, your fellow managers of the company, and your executive management team. Um, I've been fortunate enough to make it to the executive management team for our company, so now I'm in another learning curve where I'm learning about some of the things that we never really hear. You know, there's a book out right now called What the CEO Wants You to Know. And I, I suggest that you guys read that if you're going into business management. It really gives you some detail. I can't remember who the author is, but it gives you some detail as to how and what your bosses are going to be looking for as soon as you show up to go to work. A little bit about how I got started. Um, I started an industrial supply, cleaning bathrooms and sweeping warehouse floors. Um, when I was in school at the University of Utah, we were not allowed to work being on scholarship, uh, except for the times that school was not in session. Um, so growing up, the way I grew up, I, I knew I had to work. So every Thanksgiving break, Christmas break, summer break, I would go and work in industrial supply. And because of the positions that were available, I was cleaning the house and wiping people's desk off and get mad at them for leaving coffee rings on the desk and things like that. Um, but I asked at, at about, oh, probably a year before I graduated from college, um, the CEO at the time had offered me a position. He said, hey, you know, you've been here, long. I don't know how you're doing it, I don't know why you put up with this, you keep coming back, you keep working hard. Are you interested in anything else to do with business? And I said, Yes, I'd like to know everything about this company and what you do and how we do it. And I said, I'm willing to work in any department and every department just so I can get a little piece of that knowledge. So the first place they moved me was to our will call counter. And there we had customer interactions and pulling orders and doing things like that for, for customers as they came in. So it was kind of a fast paced position. Um, and then from then I moved into pulling orders for some of our industrial customers on a daily basis. So I was out in the warehouse running around just, you know, and back then we didn't have much technology. Trust me, we didn't have cell phones. We barely had just started getting fax machines and our computer was dot matrix based. So you guys are all like, what? <laughs> it was a long time ago. So all of our orders were pulled by hand and we had to write down everything by hand um, for our invoices and so forth. So it was a whole different system back then. Um, and once I moved into the uh, warehouse pulling orders, I slowly moved into the inside sales where we actually picked up the phone and made sales calls or picked up the phone for customers and filled orders in, wrote down what they needed, got that paperwork out to the warehouse and now folks were pulling the orders that I was writing. Fortunately, I didn't stay in that position very long because I really didn't like just sitting there waiting for the phone to ring and moved from there into outside sales. Uh, the only positions I haven't worked are accounts payable, accounts receivable, our technology department, and our purchasing department for industrial supply. But everywhere else I did get a chance to um, dabble in for at least six months to a year or so. Um, which brings me to that technology side. Today, one of our biggest challenges in all of business is to get folks, you know, as part of the millennial group, involved in our companies and wanting to be a part of some of these non-traditional businesses like an industrial supply company because we're not the highest tech company in, in 
out there. You know, you got all the Apples and um, Microsofts and all those folks, but we utilize all that technology to be able to make it successful and for us to be able to engage our customers at a, a faster pace and more efficiently. Right now, our business is suffering because younger folks just don't see it as sexy. They say, a screwdriver? I don't want to sell a screwdriver. You know, oh, hammers? I don't want to sell hammers. But if you look at the long-term benefits of any of the jobs that you go into, the payoff comes down the line. It doesn't come immediately. It comes down the line. In our business, our average salesperson probably makes about 95000 a year. And that's just a person that manages accounts, that goes out, solicits his business from our account managers. Some of the higher paid folks are about 120000 a year. And these are folks that have been in the business for six, seven years. So we're not talking about a lifetime. But the folks that we've had come in lately have had the ability to use technology, understand technology. Me, I'm, I'm an old dog, so it takes me a little longer to figure it out. You know, I'm still texting stuff and my wife says, hey, you know what you just said? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm trying to get better at all that. But I'm using technology now because it's a requirement for us to move at the, at the pace of business nowadays. Um, back a little bit to the sports thing. When, when I was working, I, I didn't understand at the time, all the ins and outs and repercussions of uh, people working um, when they're on scholarship at a university. Everybody thinks that all these college athletes have it made. Trust me, they don't have it made. They're working, they have a job. Um, they don't get any stipend funds unless they live off campus. Um, they do get a training table now. Back in my day, we didn't even get that. Um, but they do get opportunities to work in the community. And to take advantage of that is a big thing. A lot of athletes, student athletes don't because they all think they're gonna make it to the pros and it's not gonna happen. I try to talk to, I talk to many groups of these young folks uh, that play college football, college basketball, track, whatever. And I tell them all the time, just do the math. It's not gonna happen. What you're doing here is what's long, that's gonna bring you the longevity that you're looking for getting your education, working hard, and taking advantage of every opportunity that you have that's given out in front of you. She asked, how did I get onto the team of Chicago Bears? I was actually, I made it by mistake. Um, coming out of college, I was all set to be drafted by the Atlanta Falcons. Two games left in my senior year, I got my knee blown out. That's why I hobble a little bit when I'm walking. Um, I've got to get it finally replaced here this summer. So between the Atlanta Falcons and there were a couple other teams that had talked to me, they dropped me like a hot potato once my knee was blown out. And I thought, oh, well, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm never going to play football. Let me just work. And I actually started running 5 and 10K races. Not like this. I didn't look like this when I was doing that. But I, it, was, it was something I decided to pick up to take care of my time. And probably in March of 1983, it was March of 83. I got a call from one of the coaches with the Bears, and he says, hey, what are you doing now? And I said, uh, who is this? I thought it was my friends playing a joke on me. And they were, you know, he says, hey, this is Coach so-and-so with the Bears, and I want you to come to, the, uh, to try out, and we're going to sign you as a free agent. And I was like, hey, man, click, you know, because I figured it was one of my friends. And it rang again, and I picked it up. He goes, no, no, I'm serious. This is, this is who it is. And we want you to show up. So from there, because I hadn't really been lifting weights and stuff, I had to go back into the weight room, which was a big challenge of mine. Um, I've, I had the, the squat um, record for the University of Utah coming out of school. I was, it was about 1,100 pounds on squat. And then um, I was about third in bench press. I think it was at 515 or something like that. And I had not done anything for like almost three months. So it was a challenge to get back up and get that strength up because I knew from my experiences in the past that if you're not prepared, you don't get what you really want. When I was a senior in high school and I knew that I was you know, coming to the University of Utah, um, I was already getting ribbed by all my friends because I'm from Southern California and all my friends played, that played 
football in college all played for the Pac-10. And I was recruited by all the Pac-10. I was the number 13 offensive lineman coming out of the state of California that year. And every school in the Pac-10 that recruited me, I was recruited by Michigan, um, Ohio State, everybody. But I wanted to come to the University of Utah because that was the only school that would allow me to play defense. This is what, how decisions, the decisions you make affect your entire life. And I love defense and I like to eat up quarterbacks and all that fun stuff, so I signed here with the University of Utah. But I knew then, my, as a senior, that if I wasn't prepared, I'd be in the situation that I heard from all the Pac-10 schools, which was, we want you to come to school, we can't wait for you to get on campus, your first two years you're gonna spend working in the weight room, going to class, getting to know the, the program, and then by your junior, senior year, if we don't redshirt you, we'll allow you to play. And those are realities of, of the game. And I said, ah, there's no way. I'm not going to sit around for, you know, two, three years and wait to play. Girls don't like guys sitting on the bench. So I'm going to get out there and get something done. So I, when I signed with the University of Utah, I asked them before I signed, I said, hey, so what are my opportunities? And they were the only school that said, if you can play, you can, you can start. And as a freshman, I, I made the traveling team. I played my first game against Nebraska in front of like 80,000 people as a freshman. And then I started as a sophomore on through. So it gave me a great opportunity to, to prepare myself. I learned from that the same thing in business and school. Prepare yourself. Now, I would say that, but my freshman year in college, I was not prepared. Because I didn't hear mom going, get your butt up out of bed. All I heard was, no, oh, that's all right. <laughs> and I just covered right back up. I figured that one out pretty quick that they don't put up with that very much. Everybody thinks these guys get a free ride. They don't. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have an English professor my freshman year come and actually knock on my door in the dorms and say, you know what? If you don't do this, they get rid of you. And it woke me up. And the other, the other part was he said, I'll call your father. And that got my attention too. But. When I was going to Chicago after I had not lifted weights and done all that stuff to get myself prepared, it was a rush for three months to try to prepare myself. I had work, I started working full time at industrial because I was still trying to discover what I wanted to do. Um, I was getting ready to graduate that June. I had to withdraw from school. I had to make sure I kicked up those workouts and then showed up to camp. When I got to camp, I thought, Oh, okay, you know, as a free agent, you know, you watch on TV and they say, always say, yeah, so-and-so is a free agent. I'm like, I'm, I'm in. I made this team. I'm good to go. Little did I know they had a plan when I got there. I had to gain 30 pounds. I had to, I got fined for each day I did not gain five pounds, which is hard to do. And they put it on a training table. And I also found out that if you leave your playbook in the meeting room, you get fined 50 bucks. And they don't tell you about it. They just give you a little certificate on, on your check saying we garnished you this much because of this incident. Um, but well, I was also fortunate enough that during training camp, because of those three months I had worked and prepared myself, that when I showed up to camp, I did some good things as far as the coaches were concerned. And uh, the unfortunate part is, is early on in my career, I got my ankle blown out. So I had a cast from my waist all the way down to my heel for about uh, eight weeks and then they put in a half cast for another eight weeks. They decided not to do surgery on my ankle at that time. So I spent my whole career on injury reserve for the most part. And that's the realities of football. But having done that, I had been in three casts in nine months. I knew right then that I was done playing football. That's one of those sports that you just don't pick up. You just don't play pickup games in the park and do whatever once you get to that, that level. Um, and to me, I think it was a blessing because I really got to focus on a lot of parts of the game that I didn't know about. I helped the coaches do some, some stuff in the booth and um, got a chance to meet some great, great guys. I played with Walter Payton and Richard Dent, who was my mentor, and um, Jim McMahon, who, he played at BYU, so we didn't get along real well. But uh, <laughs> folks like that, that were part of a great football team the following year. We lost the um, division championship game my first year. And then I resigned my second year because my ankle had never really healed. So having resigned, I'm still part of the, the Alumni Association for the NFL, which 
it's pretty good because now I have a concussion packet and all that fun stuff. So when I go crazy, you guys will read about me and I'll get $10 million and I'll be good to go. <laughs> the question was asked, how did sports help me in business and where I am now? The, the emphasis on preparation is key. Um, what you're doing now, going to school, is part of your preparation. When you get up every single day, you want to prepare yourself. I do. I can't sleep at night because of all the things I'm thinking about for work. So what I've done is I've taken a pad and pen, and it's right next to my bed. And I'll wake up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'll write everything down that I'm thinking. Then I can go back to sleep. And then in the morning, if I can read it, I go out and I make sure that I follow those tasks and do those things that I, I prepared myself to do for the next day. That right there alone has made a world of difference for me. I have pins all over the house, I have pads all over the house, it drives my wife crazy. Because once I think of something, if I don't write it down right then, and you guys are probably do this yourselves, all of a sudden, 10 minutes later, you're like, I had a great idea, you know? You know, that's why I think Mark Zuckerberg probably had a pad and pen in his pocket because, you know, and he figured out how to get all this stuff done. If you don't document it and you don't write it down, really your, your, your retention and the ability to go back and take care of those tasks and, and execute them are minimized. And I think that that's one of the biggest things that I've done and I've learned in sports. Because in sports you get playbooks about that thick and they give it to you and they tell you, okay, go learn this. You're not going to learn that whole thing. So what you do is you take bits and pieces. And for me, I had to do a specific kind of learning process. I have to hear it, I have to do it, and then I have to hear it again. And if I don't do one part of that, then my retention is very minimal. If I can do all three and I can get that last little bit when they tell me again what to do, I'm okay. That's one of the reasons I can never ditch class in high school or college or anything. Because if I didn't go to class, they could share all the notes in the world they wanted to. I, it's, it was French to me. I had to be the one to write down the notes. Otherwise, I would not retain anything at all. And you learn these things about yourself as you start to go through your education process. You learn these things in business. You know, when you do things in business, you, like I said before, you'll start learning in business. You'll, you'll, every once in a while, you'll say, why do we do things this way? There may not be any logic to it. Somebody may just say, we've always done it like that. And you'll hear that a lot of times in business. But if you want to be the one that makes a difference, you say, well, have you ever looked at doing it this way? And you get those ideas from writing things down as you learn them and figuring out systems, figuring out programs, figuring out things that you can do to make those changes. Um, preparation from sports is the number one thing that I've, I've gained. The question was, what is the process that we, go, we use to pick the products that we sell our customers? Um, generally, what we get, we have manufacturers and manufacturers representatives that come to us, as you can imagine, constantly, just like we do to our customers. They come to us and they say, hey, we have this new widget. We want you to stock this thing. You only have to stock a truckload of them, and here's what it's going to cost you, and we expect your turns on this product to be this, this, and this, if you do this, this, and this. So we have a new products committee that will take all that information, and we compile it, and then we look at the marketplace. We say, okay, in this marketplace, how many competitors do we have? Um, how many options to this item do we have? For example, a hammer. There's claw hammer. There's a ball peen hammer. There's, there's uh, I can't even tell you all the different hammers. There's probably about 70 to 80 variations of a hammer. How many people in our marketplace are supplying that one item that we're looking at out of that 80 and compare that to what we do currently with our customers and see if it's a viable option for us. From there, once we decide that a product is viable, we take that and we present it to our sales team and we say, hey, go out, ask your customers if this is something that they can use in their plant. If they can, bring this information back to us. If they can't, we need to know that as well. But this is all before we say, yeah, we're going to do this. Um, so if we get a yes from our, from maybe 50% of our salespeople, we also ask them, what responsibility do you want to take in us bringing this inventory in here? So if you want to bring this inventory in here for your customer, you're going to be responsible for this much of it if you agree to this. And then you start to see hands go down, you know, as far as sales. 
But the guys that are really confident, the guys and ladies that are really confident say, yes, I believe I can sell so much of this. So based on that number, we come up with another, another determination as to the inventory that we first, we next want to bring into our stock. We go back to the manufacturer at that point and say, okay, you want us to stock so much, a truckload, we'll take a quarter truckload to start for a certain period of time. We're gonna give this two quarters to see how these sales work. If they work well and we can start to see a trend, then we'll start to talk about a half truckload from that point. And if the item becomes really successful, then we'll start to talk about truckload quantities and, and some pricing considerations. Because of course, the price at a quarter truckload is a lot more than it is at a full truckload. So we wanna take those things slow and have it methodical and also be very concise about the decisions that we make because it's very costly. Last year, we had probably $1.8 million in dead inventory. And that's a lot of money that's not being sold that's sitting in our warehouses. So we have to be really critical about the inventories that we bring in and go through this, this stringent process. Um, this, and we have a number of groups that are involved in that. We have our sales group, we have our purchasing group, uh, we have our operations people because we have to know if there's space in the warehouse and you know if there's people to pull those orders. And we have uh, our accounting folks that need to make sure that we have the funds to purchase those items. One of the fortunate things for us as a company, uh, being a $90 million company, we have no debt. We own our property, we own our buildings, we own our trucks. Um, and that's not always a good thing. You know, a lot of times you want debt to run a business because you want to have some of these write-offs along the way. So every once in a while, we'll change out our fleet or parts of our fleet and do things like that that'll help us a little bit. And I know that sounds like kind of an oxymoron for folks, folks that are just starting a business. Why have debt? There are some advantages with debt when you're running business. Um, you don't want to have enough, too much debt to where it's putting you down in the hole but you wanna have debt to make sure that your credit ratings stay up and that you have some viability uh, tax-wise and take some tax advantages there. She wants to know more about what I do with the NAACP. Um, I am the vice president of the NAACP here for Salt Lake. And what we do is, um, as a nonprofit, is we try to make sure that we defend all human rights out there in the community. Um, for example, last night we had a meeting with the director of Homeland Security, who's over the TSA here in Utah. There's been some incidents where people have complained about being improperly touched, um, being profiled, um, there's some other issues that came up. So it was nice to sit there and with only about eight of us in a room and engage with the director of Homeland Security to talk about some of these issues and what they're doing to clean up, so to speak, what's going on there with the TSA. And if we found out some great information, I mean, for example, we found out that the airport here at Salt Lake has 25,000 employees. And each of those employees go through background checks and everything else, but um, they are not, this is kind of the correlation. We were, we were talking about uh, the incident that happened in Russia with the plane going down. There's 25,000 employees, and maybe I'm not supposed to be saying all this. Um, <laughs> they only go through background checks, but they do not get screened every single day when they go to work. They believe that Russian plane went down because of one of the employees there at the airport planted the bomb on the plane. Um, now, all the authorities seem to know that it was a bomb, but nobody really wants to say it's a bomb yet, except for a couple of entities. Um, but with the NAACP, we go out and we, when we have incidents like that, when we're getting inquiries or, or um, people coming to us and saying, hey, I, was, I feel that my civil rights have been invaded or wronged or my um, human rights have been wronged, which is even bigger. That's part of my MLK commission deal is the human rights program. Um, they, we go in and we just get to the right people um, for instance, the director of the TSA, to ask them what their policies are. How are they working to alleviate these issues? What are they doing to make sure that people are, are safer and feel secure dealing with their personnel on a one-on-one -on -one basis, which they, everybody that flies has to deal with the TSA. Um, we work with not just here in Utah, we are part of a tri-state, so Idaho, Nevada, and Utah. 
we work with the issues that are going on in this tri-state area as well, as far as uh, human rights and civil rights. We have a number of attorneys that are on our board. Um, we have folks that are in education, and uh, we spend all of our time just trying to find ways to make things better for everybody. How recession proof is industrial supply? <sighs> None of us are recession proof. Back in 2008, we went through some tough times. We had layoffs. Um, we had stopped all of our bonus programs. We froze salaries and, and pay scales. The one saving grace is we tried not to lay off too many people. We just did not replace people through attrition. We just let them, let them go ahead and go. Um, but we've done a great thing being, um, being to the point where we're, we don't owe anybody any money. We're a little more secure. Um, but we're also right now in the midst of a upcoming recession in the industrial industry. Um, a lot of that has to do with the foreign markets. Uh, steel is huge. Oil is huge. Because the oil, almost everything that we have and everything that's made has some petroleum base in it. Steel is in, the components of steel are in almost everything we deal with on a daily basis. Right now we have an influx of foreign steel coming into the United States that is affecting all of our steel manufacturers so that they're down to, some of them are down to 30% of their capacity in production right now. And it's an enormous effect on them. It's things that people don't think about, lumber, there are, lumber mills that exist on the ocean right now from some of the foreign entities. They take the wood that they get from the forest here in the United States and other countries, they take it out to sea, they process it there, plywood, two by fours, things like that, and then bring it right back on shore because it's too expensive for them to take it all the way across the ocean and bring it back. So they actually have processing facilities right on the water. So that's affecting all of us here. Um, so these things affect our, con our construction people, they affect our manufacturers, so the, the recession effects for industrial supply start to come in, and they're never really immediate like they are in some industries. They're, they're fairly passive, but they hit us pretty hard um, because we count on our manufacturers. We count on folks like the aerospace industry when uh, the rocket program went down and they said, we're done. We're done with the space program. Uh, ATK, Thiokol, was, that was their business. They were in the propulsion uh, rocket, the solid fuel propelled rocket motors. And now that's a very, very, very small part of what they do. Um, you can still go out there and see them blast off the rockets once in a while, but they're probably down to about, uh, I'd say, 15, 16% of what they used to do here in our marketplace. Now, one of the areas that is really growing here in Utah that's helped us as a company to stay um, above all the fluctuations that is going on is the composite industry. And I think you guys have a composites program here in your machining um, division as well. But composites are huge. These aircraft now that are being made, used to be made of titaniums, aluminums, and everything else, and now, the majority of them are composites, which are woven materials that are put together and they're made as strong as steel. Um, companies like Boeing, um, Lockheed Martin, Northrop, they're all coming into the marketplace now because of the companies that we have that can produce um, composite parts in an effective manner. So Utah's really growing in that area, but we're, we're behind the curve in that we don't have the knowledge base of young people coming in to really help move that industry forward. And that's with engineers, that's with people in being in the, the willingness to be in management for companies like that because they really don't have those on the radar. I mean, I can't imagine how many uh, companies that you guys think about that have nothing to do with industrial production. How many of them, are, how many of them have been involved with manufacturing and production? See, nobody. See, nobody ever thinks of these industries that are out there, you know, for, uh, for you, just to, you know, heads up, like I said before, it's a great place to look, to go to get some growth, and it's really lucrative um, because everything in this country, everything that is around you, everything you see is made by somebody, and that's what we do.
We provide the products that help make every single thing that you see in some way, shape, manner, or form. Even the electronics that you see um, inside of your electronics, there are Loctite products. Loctite is an adhesive used for, you know, securing all of the, the components. I don't even want to get into all that because it blows my mind. But that material there in about a five millimeter bottle, I think that's about 75 bucks. So you can imagine we sell that by the half truckload all the time. It's just a continuous thing. And in that industry, there's a lot of products like that. Safety products, you know, just safety glasses, gloves, um, let's see, dust mask. Our safety division probably is about, ooh, $40 million for our company every single year. And that's stuff that's disposable. People get rid of the earplugs, all those type of things. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and we're just not getting the young people to, to want to stick around. The question was, do we find some that some companies use us for all of their products to produce them? Yes, we have what we call full integration um, for some of our customers. So we provide the manpower, we provide the products, we stock the products on the shelves at point of use, either through vending machines or shelving or drawer systems. Our folks distribute that throughout the plants and we also make sure that we replenish everything on a regular basis. So in those integration programs, it's really nice for us because it makes it harder for somebody else to come in and mirror those capabilities and we can keep the competition at bay, so to speak. But we do, we do complete integration on a regular basis and we do different degrees for different customers. Uh, vending is becoming a big thing for companies now. Um, vending, safety glasses, respirators, gloves, the, all those type of things, you know, and it's right next to the candy machine. So we even get into supplying the candy since we, we look at it and go, hey, we can do that too, the candy and the soda and whatever else. So we have to diversify ourselves to be, main, to be able to maintain uh, our strength in the marketplace. And the question was, are there any specific leadership traits that um, I feel help us become successful? Um, yeah, I think the, the number one thing is the ability to communicate. If you can communicate with people and have them understand that there's not an adversarial relationship, even though you're telling them bad news, um, but that you're there for their best interest, that's a really key trait that you have to have as a manager or a leader. Um, also, the engagement with the entire company, not just thinking, I only have to talk to this small group of people because nobody else uh, has anything to do with what I'm doing. You have to be able to spread yourself out amongst the masses of your company so that everybody has a relationship with you to some form or some degree. Um, I think that's real important. Nowadays, CEOs don't sit up in their office. They don't have secretaries. They come out and they work with the folks on a daily basis and they, they touch everybody. And it's something that's becoming very prevalent in business. The old way of doing business with sitting up in the throne and, and just jumping on the phone and not talking to anybody, you know, face to face are basically gone. So those are really big, big traits that you have to have. Um, the other one is not, is having a thick skin. You know, a lot of leaders really get a thorn under their butt because they hear people talking about them behind their back. That's going to happen. It's just part of the part of nature, part of human nature. People are going to say things. The best thing for a leader to do is add clarity to things so that you don't have as much as that. When people have clarity, they're not barking behind your back. They're not whispering. They understand the goals of the company. They understand your strategic plan. They understand how you're going to get there and what their part is in putting that together. And that's a real critical thing. And that's still one of the biggest problems with business now is that folks just don't feel that they're really all included in there. And a lot of times people don't ask, you know, what my part is, what my role is here. Um, and other times it's just not expressed so that they have a full understanding of it. But that's a really big key to leadership. And then the rest of it is just being there for people, having an open door policy, not, not having people have to make an appointment with you for six months down the road to be able to ask you a simple question. Being available is a big part of being a leader. You know, making sure that you're willing to talk to anybody about anything. Some things you can't tell them, 
some things you're not, they're not privy to, but you can explain that these are the parameters and this is why I can't give you all the detail, but this is what I need from you. So the question was, what is the mission statement of industrial supply? Um, in layman's terms, so I don't want to go get to rattling because my boss just made one about that long and we're still figuring that one out. Um, it's to supply or it's to provide our customers with the products they need at the speed they want it and the quality that they desire. And within all of that, there's encompasses an awful lot. Um, provide them what they need means don't switch brands on them. If they ask for a specific brand, they're asking usually for a reason. Um, there are differences in brands and manufacturers in quality. Um, at the speed, you know, do we have a integrated system in place? Do we use JIT, which is just in time inventories for that customer? Are we gonna deliver to them on our fleet? Are we gonna use common carrier? Are we gonna use UPS? Are we gonna use FedEx? That's the speed in which we have to determine or get determined to us by the customer and how to serve them. And then the quality. Quality doesn't mean just the product, but the quality means the service that we provide. You know, does that product, when it hits their dock, is, are we done with it? No, we can't be done with it. The quality is making sure that the invoicing is correct, that, the, um, that all the part numbers that they require are correct on that item, and that that item has, and is, it has all the specs that they have put into their requisition for that item. So between those three things, that, that encompasses our, our um, mission for the most part. Now. Strategy is a little different. <laughs> Strategy is huge. Strategy is part of my job change um, this year, coming up at the first of the year, in that uh, we have to de decide how to deploy people. We have to decide how we're going to deploy our resources so that we can be more effective to our customers and to the marketplace. We have to determine how we're going to bring people up through the system because nobody wants to work somewhere when they don't think they can continue to move up and earn their way to a higher position, so we've done that. We've taken some of our younger team members and we've moved them up into mid-management mid positions that we didn't even have before. I was fortunate enough this year for my job is I wrote my own job description because everybody says, well, we don't, we don't know what you wanna do. I said, what I wanna do is I wanna figure out how to golf and fish and not do anything during the course of the day. And they said, that's ah, not gonna work. So <laughs> I had to come up with a job description that fit what I thought would be most effective for the company. And that was to bring in this extra growth, this 40 some odd million dollars in the next five or so years to the company. So um, not all companies are like that. Not all companies are like ours. We're a privately held company, so we can do that. We have that flexibility. We have the ability to change on a dime. A lot of publicly held companies can't do that. They have a lot longer process to make change. They have a, a strategic plan that is very focused, that is even longer term than what ours is. We've learned from the 10 year strategic plan process that that really doesn't work. Too many things happen in between 10 years. Even with a five year strategic plan, we know things are gonna happen two years from now. I mean, between now and 2018, there's gonna be a lot of changes here in our economy. There's, it's, it's gonna be kind of spooky for a little bit. Um, and we don't know, you know, what is it that was, uh, uh, one of our board members, I think he, he called it was swag, something like a super guess as to what's going to go on. And that's what it is. But you try to guess to your best estimates that you have based on your experiences and business uh, that's taken place so far um, in your history. And also in the recent months or the years around the strategic plan that you're putting together. The question was, um, in our strategic plan and changes, uh, are we expected to raise prices? Um, yes, uh, but, but having said that, one of the things that affects price increases, most of our price increases come from our manufacturers and we have to pass on um, that for sure. But here with the way that our economy is going right now with uh, oil and steel and all these prices being so low, we don't expect the price increases to come the way that they have in the past. In our industry, this is gonna take all the, I just got you all psyched up to get into production and manufacturing and then I'm gonna take you down a little bit. In our industry, 
our average price increases from our manufacturers are between three and 5% um, on an annual basis. However, in our industry, our profit, our net profit from most industrial distribution companies throughout the country, not just here, is about 2%. So, uh, and that's for privately held companies. Publicly held companies are a little bit more, but um, that's after everything's done, everybody's paid, all the lights have been paid and all that. Um, so there's not a lot of margin in there. So we have, on pricing, we have to find ways to continually negotiate that throughout the year so that we can increase that by fractions so that we can end up. Our company, fortunately, we average about 5.5% uh, um, net after. So we, we're, we're beating the trend nationally for independence, but with that, we're constantly getting that pressure on pricing, and that comes from manufacturers and them doing what they're doing. There's a lot of consolidation going on right now uh, with manufacturers, huge manufacturers like 3M, Honeywell, some of these folks that have been around forever. The question is, is the, are the you know, price increases per manufacturer or across the industry or product lines, right? And it's usually by manufacturer um, because the manufacturers are doing the same thing that we're doing. They're going back to their, the people that provide the raw product and they're negotiating pricing. And if they can keep them low, the ones that really want to maintain partnerships and relationships with distributors are going to say, well, we're going to hold this pricing for a certain period of time, and we can't do that because this is what we've done. Um, that disclosure is only done after you've developed that relationship with the supplier over many, many years. Most of the time, if they don't know you and you don't know them, they're just going to say, here's this flat 3%, take it or leave it. You know? So the, that's one of, that brings me to this point. One of the things that's changing in business is business is becoming um, between um, manufacturers, uh, distributors, and end users. We're starting to, I have to be careful about these things because sometimes you can't say them. We're starting to open the kimono. And we call it an open kimono because we figure there's nothing underneath it. You're just exposing yourself and everybody knows what each other's doing. So we call it opening com the kimono and it allows for all of us to come to the table to really talk about what our true needs are. Um, some companies at, at the customer level call their biggest problems, their biggest issues, which are usually to do with products like ours, they call them their ugly babies. And it's just a term that they use because our products are very low value. Can you imagine a, a $35 hammer, but you're making a you know, $20 million part for an aircraft? That's a very small part of their spend. But if on one day we don't have that hammer there for those employees to use it during that eight hour shift to be able to put that, that part together, what that cost is to those customers. See, and there's, that's to the quality side that the gentleman asked me about before. If we are, the, if we are at fault for something like that, we're in big trouble. So we really look to finding the value in both the quality, the price, the delivery, the relationship that we have with those customers so that we can minimize those incidents. Because this is, people are dealing with people. Things happen. Things happen. And, you know, screw-ups are going to occur. Um, I had a customer yesterday. We didn't have a, this is a nuclear plant. The second pallet never showed up. And everybody was like, where is it? It was sitting in our warehouse because our, on the quality side on us, our operations people wrapped it twice so it hid the label. So we didn't know where that pallet went until somebody tore it down, found the label, we got it shipped out this morning. But that created a corrective action from that customer, which is a Westinghouse company, a big company. And now I have to go back and do a corrective action report for that. So now, here I go spending my time fixing something that should have never happened in the first place. That was very, very simple. And we had a simple solution for it as well, but it's a critical issue for the company as far as the manufacturers go. Yeah, so relationships are a big part of all that. Oh, good, we're done. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me.